Gary Mayo has been a part of Lighthouse Church for quite a long time now. Uh, leads our men's ministry or men's uh, connect group, uh, Forged, every Monday night. Or well, it's not every Monday night. It's, it's a lot of Monday nights. Second and fourth. Second and fourth of every month. And uh, I've known Gary for several years. And uh, Gary, Gary is a stickler for the word. And he's going to challenge you tonight. I believe that with all of my heart. But I believe the reason why the, when the Lord laid it in my heart when I came to Lighthouse, and I'm, I'm reiterating something that most of you know already, is that I believe that the reason what God wants me to, God wants me to lead is a congregation that's raising up other leaders and raising up people with gifts and talents and anointings to do what they're called to do. And, and uh, ultimately, it's not about building a platform or a podium. Uh, it's not about building an alt. It's not building about anything about building a man. Uh, this is not my church. This is not Pastor Barry's church. This is the Holy Spirit's church. And, and we're just going to trust and believe God that the way, we, the way that we see it, uh, handling that out and, and manifesting that is by raising up people. If all I tell you to do is inspire you to be in ministry and I don't give you an opportunity to be in ministry, I'm, I'm frustrating you and I don't believe God is a frustrating God. Do you? So would you do me a favor? I'm going to pray over Gary, and I'm just going to give it up to him, and he's going to take us to the ending, ending, ending platform, and then he'll call me back up because I have an announcement I have to make at the end of service. So, Father, I just pray for Gary right now, and I just ask right now, Lord, that we would have ears to hear all that the Spirit of God would speak through this man. I pray, Lord, as I've already prayed for him tonight, I ask, Lord, that you'd cause his tongue to be that of a ready writer. I pray, Lord, that as he ministers, he ministers not out of his inward witness of his, of, of his own self, but, Father, out of the oracles of heaven. And Father, I pray that the word of God would come forth with power and anointing. I pray, Father, that the anointing would rest on Gary and rest on us as we receive your word tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give it up for Gary. Amen. Thank you. Um, Pastor Bob asked me to do this a while back, and uh, I have this, I, I, I don't hesitate when he says, when anybody asks me to speak, I don't know I don't know why, but, you know, there's, there's a lot of anxiety associated with this, but yet there's excitement, too, you know. So it's a lot of mixed feelings, but now it's finally here, so I get to share. Um, you know, um, how's everybody doing? Everybody good? Well, I'm fantastic. <laughs> um, you know, when he asked me to do this, something came into my head and said, okay, this is what I'm going to speak on. And, and I started thinking about it, and I was putting thoughts together, and, and it, was, uh, it, it, it just wasn't coming together. Well, I know this happens to people all the time that get up and teach. Last week, he said, no, nope, you're going to teach on this tonight, okay? And uh, Pastor Candy has taught on it already on foundations, but he said, I want you to speak on this because there's somebody here tonight that needs to hear this. I, th I think it's very important, um, and it's not something, part of this is not going to be something that's going to be easy for me to talk about, but yet it's, it's a proof of forgiveness, and that's what, what this is about, the call for, to forgiveness. <clears throat> the Webster Dictionary calls uh, the definition of forgive to cease to feel resentment against an offender or pardon. Okay, I think that's that's really clear, concise, and so <clears throat> to cease to feel that resentment, that's important. Now, I'm, I've got some bullet points tonight that I'm going to go over. Um, the first one is, why do we need to forgive? Simple. Uh, next is examples of forgiveness in the Bible. Examples of forgiveness in my own body or my own life. Example of non-forgiveness and its consequences. And then some things that I've written down that will help you uh, forgive people when, when it's hard to forgive. Because, you know, nowadays a lot of people are not very friendly and they're not very forgiving of each other. And it's a very me, me, me world. The Bible says in Matthew 6, 14, and 15, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. 
You know, the first time that I read that scripture, it really, really hit me hard. It was one of them scriptures, you know, where it's like, wow, this is saying a lot right here. And we have to listen to this. This is not a suggestion by God. This is a command to forgive. You cannot leave this earth with any unforgiveness in your heart. You can't. You've got to search yourself. And you've got, to, you've got to get this forgiven and taken care of. And I, I had a friend one time that he said, I just can't forgive. I can't do it. He said, I had a boss that fired me one time, and I just can't forgive him. And I said, you're a Christian, right? He said, yes. I said, you have to forgive. You've got to put, get in your heart to forgive him. That doesn't mean you like him. That doesn't mean that you're going to be buddies with him. That is something for you to release uh, this this chains that's, that are in your heart. The salvation that has been given to you by God is through the forgiveness of your sins when Jesus died on the cross. So think about that. He forgave us. And I know for myself, I am not worthy to be forgiven. I have a lot of bad things that's in my life and has happened to me. And, and I don't deserve this forgiveness, but... Thank you, Lord, the salvation he's given me. Um, you'll also have a, a life of, of a restful heart and mind. It gives you peace. You know, when, when you forgive somebody, it allows you to free up. And like to say, the chains, the chains will break and they'll come off of you. Okay? And you can live at peace with yourself. Um, you know, I, I work with some people that... Uh, I don't see forgiveness in their heart sometimes. And you can tell they're just bound up. They just they can't seem to uh, just be happy because they've got so much chains. They're just, they're just too bound. I'm going to talk about examples of forgiveness in the Bible. And the first example I'm going to go to is in Genesis 45, 4 through 7. And I'll read it first, and then I'll talk about what was happening at that time. And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near to me. So they came near. Then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Two years the famine has, has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in this earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Um, everybody knows the story of, of Joseph, but if you go back and think about it, Joseph was the, the baby of the family, his father's favorite, and they all resented him, okay? And they sold him in to the slave market. You know, how could you forgive somebody that would do that to you? But we know that the faith of Joseph was so strong, he knew that God was going to take care of him and bring him to a better place. He had the dream about, you know, the, the bowing down to him and stuff, you know. And uh, so he knew that God had plans for him. He was not, uh, the proof of his walk with God was the proof of his life in that he was always came back to the top. He wasn't the tail. He always ended up being the head every time, you know, even t in to the last. And he was able to forgive his brothers and it, doesn't, it didn't matter what they did to him, you know, family. And that's something I know a lot of people struggle with forgiveness in families. But that's, that's so important because families are blood and, and we need to forgive. The next example of forgiveness in the Bible that I've, that I've used is uh, when Stephen was stoned. And uh, Acts 760 says, Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge me with this sin. And when he had said this, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, Stephen 
was a Holy Spirit filled man. And the Pharisees knew this. But God had turned Stephen's heart to a heart of flesh. And even though, because he could see Jesus on the right hand of God in heaven, he, he knew that he was going to a better place and that he could forgive these people. It was so important. And he, the last thing he said was, I forgive them. I forgive them. And then the, the last example is Luke 23, 34a. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Now you think about that. When, when Jesus went to the cross, they nearly beat him to death. They made fun of him. They pulled his beard out. They did all these terrible things to him. But yet, on the cross... He said, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That is, that's true forgiveness. And that forgiveness is what he's given us today because of that death on the cross. The next story that I'm going to talk about is examples of forgiveness in my own life. I got saved back in 06. And after several years of me being mentored, I had people that came to me and said, would you mentor me? And I said, sure. Well, I had this one, one gentleman that uh, was about my age, but he'd had trouble with drugs his whole life. And uh, he, he wanted me to mentor him. And I said, okay, that'd be great. And we had a program that was called Radical Change that helped people with drug problems and emotional problems and things like that. And I, I suggested that he go to this. And I told him that if he went to this, I would go with him, even though at the time I didn't feel like I needed to go. And so we went together. During that time at Radical Change, one of the things that we did was we had to clean out the inside as well as the outside. And how we cleaned our inside out was we, we took a confidant and sat down and shared with them everything that we could think of that's ever happened to us, right? Right? Well, <clears throat> let me back up a little bit. For a big chunk of my life was to do with drugs and alcohol and, and just any kind of debauchery, sex, anything that I could get into. I mean, it's like I've said in the past, when your mother said, if they jump off the bridge, would you jump off the bridge? And their, their mother was talking about me. I was the one dragging people off the bridge. <laughs> and, but... <laughs> That's, that's kind of the person I was. And, and I was constantly in, into these drugs, and I never really understood what I was getting out of this. This was not helping my life. I didn't get a college degree because of it, because I was too involved with the drugs and didn't care about life. Well, after we started going to this radical change, um, I started emptying out. And when I started emptying out, Something came to my mind that I had not thought about in years. I guess because your mind suppresses things that are really damaging to you. And uh, it took me back to, a, I was probably four, five years old. And was playing out in the yard with a, another little girl who was a little bit older than me. And uh, she molested me. And uh, it affected me my whole life, not even realizing what had caused this because my mind had put it behind me. Um, but this was something that was, when it came back into my remembrance, I started going back through it and I started thinking about this, this, this girl. Okay, keep in mind, she was like six years old um, and she did this to me I got to thinking somebody must have done this to her right and I started having compassion for her um, and because I grew up in a small town I, I knew her and her as she was growing up in life and um, at 13 years old she was pregnant um, and then I had heard through 
the grapevine or whatever, that she ended up being a prostitute here in Nashville. Um, the, uh, and then I, then I heard that she was not only a prostitute, she even had a, a brothel herself, and she was like the madam at the brothel. And, and I did have some, some things where I said, you know, maybe I should go seek, seek her out, you know. And, um, but she died. Died due to uh, the lifestyle, I'm sure, drugs and whatever. But the most important part of this whole story, and this story is not something that was easy for me to, to share. I, I, I was kind of back and forth about this because this is very personal to me. But what happened was, is I had somebody confirm it to me last Sunday that I'm supposed to tell this story because there's somebody in here that needs to hear it. Now, because my heart has turned from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh once I got saved, my compassion for her was not a, 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 a thinking, what has this person done to me? They've messed me up. They have caused my life a living hell most of my life. But it was an uh, idea of, you know, I forgive this girl. You know, it, it, it's not her fault. She didn't really know what she was doing. We are both, you know, at that age, don't know, have any idea. But I kept thinking, well, what was her life? You know, how was her life? Um, but I, I did forgive her. I did forgive her. I, 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 I believe that... Uh, that her life was so terrible that my life was nothing as bad as hers. I mean, I, I don't know a better way to say it. And if anybody needs forgiveness in my life, was her. Because even though she had done one of the worst things to me. I'm going to give you another example of forgiveness in my life. Back when I first got saved, I'd read this scripture that we read first. You know, it was Matthew 6, 14, 6 uh, 14 and 15. And I started searching myself and I said, Lord, is there anybody in my life that I have not forgiven, that I don't know? You know, and uh, so what happened, I was laying in bed on a Saturday night and I was sound asleep. And while I was sleeping... Uh, the best way to describe what happened, it felt like a thunderbolt hit me while I was in the bed. And it just jolted me. And I, and I sat up, and I'm like, what in the world just happened to me? And I mean, I was shaking, and, and uh, I laid back down and went to sleep like that. And I started dreaming. And uh, I started dreaming about a, a person named David Augustine. And, of course, during the dream, you know, you, you, it's like, what is this all about? You know, you don't know, you can't control the dream. But I woke up the next morning, I'm thinking, David Augustine, why did I dream about him? That's kind of strange. And then I got to thinking about it. David Augustine was a boss of mine that had fired me several years ago, unjustifiably. And I had not let it go. I had not forgiven him. And God pointed it out to me that, look, you know, you need to forgive this person. And, and this is what's important for, for everybody is if you are in the same situation, ask him to reveal them to you because he will and, and make your life and clean your life up. Um, pray that God will show you the person or persons you need to forgive. Now I'm going to talk about examples of non-forgiveness and its consequences. And this is one of the, the best examples I ever came across. And it was from a book called A Divine Revelation of Hell by Mary Kay Baxter. And what, what happened in this book was Mary Kay Baxter was having dreams. And she had dreams every night for a month. And God would take her to hell. Now, she, she also had a book called A Divine Revelation of Heaven, where it's the same type thing. God would take her to heaven, and, and they'd walk around together. And so, but she was walking with Jesus in hell. 
okay? And they're walking down this path, and beside them is these pits. And in these pits are fire, and there's people in these pits, and they're burning, and they're, you know, and they're screaming, and they're yelling, and, and he's showing her what, what hell is going to be like, right? And they come by this one lady that was burning, and she said, uh, Jesus, come here, I need to ask you. And she says, why am I even here? And he says, uh, she said, I went to church. I was a good Christian. I read my Bible. I prayed. I walk with the Lord every day. I, I, I don't understand. It's, it's, it's not fair that I'm here. And Jesus said, simply, remember when you were married, your husband had an affair. And she said, yes. And he said, he repented and came back to you. And she said, yes. And he said, you never forgave him. And I gave you every chance to do it. And that really struck me. It's like we've got to forgive. There's no other way around it. <clears throat> I found that to be a real... Uh, touching story I mean it really hit me hard it was one of them that just I still think about it now because if you believe that hell is real you definitely don't want to go there um, I think that uh, a lot of people and in the book uh, 23 minutes in hell uh, the author of that book asked why Jesus took him to hell he said this is why Jesus took me to hell he said because most People do not believe in hell. And he said, most of my Christians don't believe in hell as well. I, I think it's important that we seek it out and understand um, these things. Here's a few things that help you uh, to forgive. See people through God's eyes. Remember, they may have had a bad day. You don't know what's happened in their life. But how does God look at people? Well, God looks at people as his creation, right? And when you create, when you say, for some, say you build something, you, uh, you make something, you're always proud of it, whatever it is, you know? It's like, it's... Because you put your heart and soul into it. And that's what God has done for each one of us. He has put his heart and soul into it. And so if we can step back from our eyes and look through his eyes and see people the way he sees them will change the way you see the world. The way you see the world. And this right here will also help you with that same situation. It's from Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if everybody knows who C.S. Lewis is. He wrote the Chronicles of Narnia. Probably one of the greatest apologists of the 20th century. Uh, just a wonderful man. He wrote this book, Mere Christianity, from a standpoint of no denomination. No Catholic, no Baptist, no Assembly of God, no nothing. Just basic Christianity without any sways either, any way. And in this, he came up with this, uh, this law. Now, you know, a law is dead solid. It, it's, it can't be changed. It's, you know, like the law of gravity. It's there, and you're not going to do anything about it. It's a law, okay? He came up with something called the law of human nature, okay? There's two parts to it. This is the first part. Everyone understands there's a morality that we should all live by, right? Everybody. In other words, we think everyone should respond in situations by what our morality dictates. The second part of it is, is we don't live by our own morality ourselves. So what he's saying is everybody has morality. Now, from a Christian standpoint, we, our morality is, is based upon the word, Okay. But even in prison, they have a standard of morality themselves. Okay, so everybody is born with a certain amount of morality in their life. 
So the, the thing about it is, is you can't expect everybody to act, talk, think, believe like you. Okay? If you can get that in your head, it will free your life. Because, you know, how many times have you heard people say, well, they're just stupid. But why are they saying that? Because they're not thinking like them. And people are not going to think like you. You know, so we've got to give grace to people and understand. Just like the, the, the thing about Christians. We can't expect non-Christians to act like Christians. I mean, they, uh, they don't have what we have. So we've got to give them some grace for that. The second part, we don't live by our own morality. Yeah, we expect everybody to act like we want them to act, but we don't act like that sometimes. So the main thing for me, it was one of them things, it was like epiphany for me. It's like, oh, okay. Well, they're not going to all think like me. And if I, if I live my life thinking that they're all, they all got to think like me and act like me, I'm going to be discouraged my whole life. Never going to be happy. You know, so I have to understand that they're not all going to do that. And, and when you do that, you'll be freed. <clears throat> Allow your heart of stone to be turned to a heart of flesh through your continual progressive sanctification as you mature as a Christian. If anybody had a stone, a heart of stone, it was me. Because for most of my life, if you couldn't do something for me, I didn't care about you. And that was a lot of the drugs. If you couldn't supply me with drugs or if you couldn't smoke a joint with me or didn't smoke a joint with me, I didn't care about you. And I was always angry and I was looking for a fight. Mad all the time and so unhappy and bound up. But when I got saved in 06, God transformed me in such a... Uh, uh, a way that it was beyond my control. I mean, I, I was like, what has happened here? You know, it hit me. So, well, let me give you a little background to that. I was, I was raised in a Baptist church, but when I got out of, left for college, I never went back to church. Never. This church wasn't for me. But at eight years old, I was, I went down to be a Christian. And in that church, they told me I was a Christian. The pastor said, you're a Christian. My parents said I was a Christian. Everybody said I was a Christian. And because of the theology, they say, you know, nothing can change that. So when I got saved, I was not looking for salvation because I already had it. Right? Well, it, my life didn't show it whatsoever. And God knew that. And he came to me and saved me. I woke up one day and everything in my life had changed and I, and I became a Christian that day. And because I wasn't seeking salvation and he gave it to me, I didn't know what happened to me. Because everything I thought was important was not important anymore. And, and it was like I, 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 had to read the, I had to read the Bible. I had to read it. I just couldn't stop. And um, the people that I worked with, they said, dude, what's happened to you? Something's changed. You're, you've, you're not the same person you were. And I said, uh, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. But, but God came to me a couple of days after that in thought and said, you were not saved and I have saved you. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Because, because of where I came from, I would have never tried to obtain salvation because I thought I was there. Right? And it's kind of funny, back before me and Elby started seeing each other, I was on Facebook, and um, the, an old girlfriend was on there. And she was single, I was single, so I, I looked her up, and uh, I called her, and I started talking to her. And we were just talking and stuff, and she's, she stopped me about halfway through, and she said, Wait a minute, wait a minute. Is this, th who is this? <laughs> I said, this is, this is Gary Mayo. She goes, and I was like, I don't understand. 
She said, this is not the Gary Mayo I remember. And I thought, thank you, Lord. Things have changed. So I was much, much better off because of it. In conclusion, we must forgive. It is a command from God. And the consequences of not doing so are grave. Forgiveness brings peace to your soul. Search your heart and determine if there's anybody you need to forgive. Lincoln made a statement one time, and I'm going to finish with this. It says, once President Lincoln asked how he was going to treat the rebellious southerners, which is us, when they had finally been defeated and returned to the Union of the United States. The questioner who was asking him this expected that Lincoln would take a dire vengeance. But he answered, I will treat them as if they had never been away. That's forgiveness. That is true forgiveness. Let, let me pray. Father in heaven, we love you so much. We praise your holy name. We call you the, the master of the universe, Father. Hallowed be your name. Thank you, Lord, for giving me this opportunity. I just pray that it touched somebody tonight. That they will think about what I said. Because what I said was from you only. It was not from me. Father, you use me for, you, for your purposes, Father. And I surrender to you completely. Now, Father, I pray a blessing over everybody here. And that they, were, they listened to me and nobody left. Father, and I, I thank you for that. If there's anybody that, that uh, needs to share with it, our pastor, I'm sure we'll be able to help. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Notice how he threw that right back on me. What? He said, I'm sure my pastor can help. No, actually, <laughs> I'm, uh, actually, actually, what I was thinking as you were praying, you know, guys, in all, all, all kidding aside, I just was laughing to myself. You know, one of the things that's critically important, if you're struggling with unforgiveness in your heart, don't leave tonight. Don't leave carrying that weight. Um, I wrote some really interesting things down. I said, do you realize, and, and, and as Gary was ministering, I wrote this down. He, he gave us Matthew 6, 15, and he made a statement. He said, when you forgive, it provides rest and a restful mind. He shared the testimony about the girl, and he said this. It, it provided personal healing. He was talking about forgiveness of his boss, and he said it provided personal peace. He was giving us illustrations at the end. He said things that will help you, and he said, People may not think like me, and it provides freedom to not be worried about what other people think. And then the last thing he mentioned is just says, allow your heart to be turned to a heart of flesh, which provides tenderness. You realize that, that without forgiveness, those things don't happen. Tenderness, peace, joy, all of that stuff. It doesn't happen. So, Gary, thank you very much. Sure. I appreciate it much. And, and guys, seriously, if you want to, uh, talk, catch Gary at the end of service. Catch Gary at the end of service. And, and I'm not messing with that. He's got, he brought the message tonight. And so I want to encourage you. We're going to do something real quickly as we get ready to dismiss. I want everybody to stand to your feet real quickly. I'm going to pray a blessing over you as we go. Uh, but I need the gentleman to help me if you don't mind. We're gonna, we've got a women's conference. And I want to take just a few moments right now, and I just want to pray. And uh, how many of you know that, that when people set aside time to go to a conference, God needs to do something. And people need to be ready to receive what God wants to do. And so we're going to get ready. We're going to tear down the sanctuary. And, and what I mean by that is, is this. The front 70 seats we're not even touching. It's the back seats that we're going to stack and we're going to move them into the gym. We're a little bit early, so we are not. Hear me, gentlemen and ladies that are helping. We're not disrupting the youth ministry. Just because we got done a few minutes early doesn't mean we disrupt them because we got to get our thing done. If they're still in service, they're in prayer, they're doing what they need to do, we're giving leadership to the Holy Spirit in that regard. 
But what we can do is we can tear down in the back section of this uh, sanctuary and be ready uh, for everything that's going to happen. But before we go, let's just pray for our ministry, uh, for, the, for the women's ministry. Pastor Candy, Miss Reese, uh, Dana, uh, Kim, the team that has helped her, Miss, uh, Miss Tammy. There's been a wonderful, Lisa, I think, is involved at a, at a significant level. Uh, there's several ladies that have just really sacrificed a lot of time to put this together. And so uh, I just believe that it's going to be a great event, okay? And guys, take care of the house. Mama's out, take care of the house, all right? Don't get all freaked out. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name as we get ready to dismiss this service. We just take a moment and we pause. In the next several hours, Lord, this sanctuary is going to be turned into an environment where women are going to be encouraged to rejoice. And so, Father, I just pray a, a supernatural anointing upon the altar, upon this podium, upon the tables and the chairs and the seats of this room. Because women are going to come and each one of them are going to have unique things that they're walking through in life. Some of them have walked through it and they have the victory. Some are just fixing to walk into it and some are in the middle of it and they're up knee deep and they're doing everything they can to breathe. God, I just pray right now for the women of our church. I pray, God, that this weekend would be a transformational weekend. Let it be radical, God. Let it be so powerful in them. Let the worship be so uplifting, encouraging. Lord, that, that our ladies would be impacted. And Lord, when a woman speaks to a woman, I believe, Heavenly Father, that some will be set free forever because they've, been, they've, they've set aside this time. I pray for Pastor Candy. I pray for Miss Reese. I ask God that the anointing of God would be upon them as they speak and lead. And God, I pray for every aspect of this service, the, the services to be anointed. God, I pray for the people as we go. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you'd watch over us, keep us, guide us, and direct us. Lord, allow us to always be willing workers in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, so just so you know, the front 70 seats. So if I could have a Jeremy or somebody, could somebody, a Pastor Barry, I didn't do it. I meant to do it. Somebody count out the front 70 ro seats in the rows, and then we'll just kind of push the other seats back, and we'll go from there. Thank you so much, guys. Have a great night. Can we have some music just so we can have some teardown stuff?